Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Battle Hop Gaming Podcast, episode 210, live board game Q&A. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Battle Hop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Battle Hop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So tonight we're taking it easy and answering some quicker questions, stuff that's not enough for a full episode, as well as taking questions live from our chat room. Now that Q&A will be followed by a review of the last Valeria small box game that we have to look at, Siege of Valeria. This is a single player dice game. We wrap up with a really short Bellhops tabletop with not too much gaming going on at all. Find links to the games and other things we mentioned on the show through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 210. Before we get to answering questions, let's stop by the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some feedback and other comments we've gotten on our content. Up first, we have a Dice Camp post from Andrew Kuchling, who called out our Charterstone review. They tooted, now that we've finished our Pandemic Legacy Season Zero campaign, played with our friends, the four of us will turn back to Charterstone, a very different legacy game. We haven't played it since February 2020, so tonight I reread the initial set of rules. This review of Charterstone by Tabletop Bellhop also refreshed my memory of how the game worked. It was really helpful. Of course, we'd already played two games, so tomorrow I'll we'll have to look at our manual and see what we unlocked. Well, thanks for the great shout out, Andrew. I'm glad our review was helpful to bring you back up to speed with Charterstone. Personally, I want to go back and play Charterstone too. Um, since we published that review, and I think at the bottom of the review, I even said, I'm like, oh, do I pick up? the uh, recharge pack or not. And well, we did pick it up. So we actually split on it. So Tori, Kat, Deanna, and I all split four ways on it and picked it up. But we haven't actually started our second campaign yet, but we are looking forward to it. Well, next we have a comment from Sneffs. In regard to our topic of protecting your games from a couple of weeks back, they write, I've gone from protecting everything with sleeves, covers, and containers to <laughs> protecting practically nothing. These games really are not that valuable and the collector mentality is a trap. Well, I know Sean agrees with you on this one, Sness, uh, and I do know others will become more lax about game protection over the years. Whereas I'm actually kind of trending the other way, but that's all because I'm now doing public play events again. It had been a long time, but the problem this time, again, not necessarily a problem, but the, the issue, the what, 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 why this is happening now is because these public play events happen to be happening at a bar and restaurant. And no matter how many times I tell people show up early, eat first, people insist on eating while playing games. So I, at this point, I'm thinking of adding a little more protection to my games. But one of the things that we didn't really dive too into on the topic, but something that I thought of since, is I think one of the things we didn't really talk about was the difference between protecting your games and preserving your games. I am not that interested in preserving my game so that it's in mint condition 10 years from now. And when I pass it on to my kids, it looks just as good as the day I got it. But I do feel I probably should do more to protect my games. Well, let's finish off with a comment from Sean. Wait, no, not me. Sean Fletcher, the designer of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances in regards to our Thrills and Chills review. Sean writes, losing a cauldron born token to a standard attack can be frustrating, but that's a turn your opponent effectively made zero progress towards KO VPs. See, I can't argue with that, but I do want to point out, and maybe this is a, a game designer thing that more game designers might want to think about, is that putting out Cauldronborn only to lose them before you've done anything with them just doesn't feel good. Well, yes, gameplay-wise, they may be great, and maybe they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, what they're designed to do, is to soak that attack so the opponent's not making progress towards knockouts but it just doesn't feel good to the player at the time. And that player who has that feeling is going to be unlikely to want to play that character more and learn to play them better. At least that's my experience I had with it. Sometimes just because something's the right move, the right way to do it doesn't mean that players are going to want to do that just because it's the right move. Well, that's all the feedback we have to share tonight. Remember that just because we don't read your email or comment on the show doesn't mean we don't appreciate it. One more thing before we get to the Q&A. An announcement. 
Before we get on with the show, we just want to remind everyone that we will all be at the Origins Game Fair later this month, June 20th to the 25th. Now, we've mentioned this before, but I wanted to point out something that might have gotten missed in the message, and that means we will not be recording a podcast episode on the 21st of June. So don't come here to Twitch looking for us on the 21st, no, and don't be confused when a new podcast episode doesn't drop on the Tuesday following. Well, I'm sure we could figure out some way to be able to broadcast from the show, but based on past experiences with the internet in Columbus downtown, at least around Origins, I don't think it's going to be worth the trouble to try to get us live on the air. We will, of course, be getting loads of content for the future, though. And while review copies copies will likely be the bulk of that, there are plans to record videos, still images, mm -hmm. and possibly even some audio while we're there. Just not a whole show. And definitely not a live show. We won't be broadcasting anything live. Watch our social media feeds. We'll probably share some pictures. I'm sure I'll be tweeting, maybe some Instagram, but no, no, no Twitch streams live from the showroom floor. That's not something we'll be doing. Watch the Dice Tower or Board Game Geek stream for that. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So there's a lot going on in my life right now that I don't really want to get into here other than to say I haven't really had any time for gaming lately, nor have I had a lot of time to do my usual bellhop stuff. So while we strongly considered canceling tonight, we decided against it for a number of reasons, including the fact we're going to be missing a show later on this month due to Origins, and simply I could use some time talking games with everyone and leaving the other stuff behind. So to keep things simple, we decided to go with a live Q&A tonight. Answering questions from those here live in our chat room, as well as a question or two that we've gotten that aren't quite big enough to dedicate a full show to. So thanks again to everyone who joined us live for this, and now's the time to start getting your questions in while we jump to one from our question pile. So while the uh, chat is going, and they have already started, we're going to move on to a question from our question pile, which looks like a fun one. Now, Math Guy Dave asks, what are some video games that should never be board games. This is hard because almost every single one I can think of, someone's already made a board game of it. Now, whether they should or not might be a different question, but I'm mainly thinking 80s stuff that's terrible, but like I have, it's not, it's called Pixoy, but I have a board game version of Pac-Man that is actually a lot of fun. It was part of the ELO 8-bit box. Well, I mean, there was a Pac-Man board game that yeah, was but that wasn't good. It wasn't that bad. I don't know. It was a roll and move and whoever rolled higher one. And he collected <laughs> marbles that got lost in your house everywhere. Yeah. It, it, now it, there it, is a Pressman update to that one that has lights and sounds, but I haven't oh, played that one. All right. Uh, I think this becomes a problem because it, a lot of it is going to depend on what the board game is. Uh, so whether or not it, it's well designed as a board game, for instance, a game that, comes to mind as something that should never have a board game created is Minecraft, except there is a Minecraft board game and it's fantastic. See? That's it. I, I, <laughs> that's the problem I'm having. So, so, like so open world games to me are the ones yeah. that, 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 you know, head off the list, except we know that there is a fallout board game and while not perfect, yep. it's pretty good when it doesn't, it was. when it doesn't go badly. Uh, and, and it can be done right. Just like they did in uh, horizon zero dawn by focusing on one part of the world, instead of giving you the full HZD experience, you right. just got to go on a hunt, which feels a lot like going on a hunt in the game. Absolutely. And while the Minecraft uh, builders and biomes game doesn't feel like you're playing Minecraft, you're not running there. There's enough. There's they've added all of the major aspects mm -hmm. into that game. So while no, it's a different experience it still gives you the vibe yeah. of Minecraft, unlike the Minecraft card game, which came mm -hmm. out earlier and was a horrible train wreck of a disaster yeah. and should never have been made into something. So the, the big one that, that I came up with, and this was talking to Deanna, is, are the big JRPGs. I've yet to see those implemented well, like your Dragon Quest, your Final Fantasy VII's, your, your huge epic 100-hour-plus games i don't think any of those could really be ported over well and i haven't even seen people take a segment of those and do them well like final fantasy tactics yes you could do and they've done it when there's like a tiny epic version of that but like to really get the feel of a dragon quest super railroaded adventure with a growing party where you're choosing your party members 
and the entire game is about exploration and then the combat turn based combat system. I don't think I, I don't think many big sprawling JRPGs would port over well to, to board games at all. Yeah, no, I'm thinking like Genshin Impact, of course, is is you know still huge right now, and and a lot of that is um, the sort of questing nature of it and the the drops and things there's so many yeah, exactly. aspects of modern upgrading your equipment and yeah, so like, many aspects yeah. of modern games that are are too much now that's that being said that's not to say that there isn't a designer out there somewhere that could True. find the magic and distill one of those big games down to a manageable small well, comparatively small game that really does give you that vibe um they just haven't yet and, and we can't picture it but no. again proving that you know fallout and and minecraft again as perfect examples have done this it is possible to in some way if you can find the magical twist and and bit that's going to encapsulate the feel of whatever that mm -hmm. game is and that's really the thing you need you need a way to encapsulate the feel of the game uh and so i'm wondering a game that just came to mind for me is something like five nights at freddy's um there are board games for it there's at least three. Oh, there are yeah, yeah. See, like, like when you get into the horror all party games, games yeah when you get into these horror games that are built on jump scares essentially i i feel i i struggle to imagine how those could properly be presented yeah. in a board game the only reason i know is they're often on sale and i've shared deals on them and i don't even know the license i'm just like oh it's another five nights at freddy's game from what I understand, at least one's a hidden role. Another one that's in the same line is a Hello Neighbor or Hi Neighbor. Right. I don't even know what the show is called. Yeah. So I, 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 I haven't played those to tell you if they actually work. Fair. But yeah, again, jump scare based video games, uh, that, those, that, that horror genre that really focuses on mm -hmm. the jump scare, I feel they should probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in, in general horror games. The, the, the other one I'm thinking is the first person shooter without the exploration, like like your boomer shooters. They tried. Adrenaline tried. It does not feel like I'm playing a boomer shooter. I think it's fascinating yeah. that they managed to turn a, a battle royal, a death match in Quake into an area control game, but it doesn't feel like that at all. You're, you, there's no tension. There's no speed. There's no rush and pick up stuff. Yeah. It just, it can't be done well. And I don't think it can be. I think it should never be made into a board game. I think that is a solely video game experience of, yeah. of, of that rush and shoot and fire. Uh, it's, it's interesting though because you know I think of Doom, um, and I there think are Doom board games. There, there are, um, and they shouldn't be, and and I think there shouldn't be. But when you you mentioned Battle Royale, and I think a Fortnite board game could work again if you found the right twist on it, because it's no, yeah. you're not going to get running around. You don't want movement included at all. But you so want, maybe some kind of quick playing card, real time card game or yeah, something. It's it's it. There's definitely there's definitely some possibility there. But I am not by any means, nor do I play a uh, one on TV, a board game designer. Yeah, um, not my speciality at all. So I will leave that to experts. Uh, maybe Rogers out there can start designing games. The next one is platformers. The, I've never seen a good Mario style game. A couple people have tried to do the scrolling. There's um, Battle at Kemble's Cascade is one that's trying to do the scrolling. That's actually a, a what do you call them? A bullet hell yeah. style game. Not not a side scroller. But then but we've like, done, we, we have a successful Dig Dug game. We have the racing uh, platform games. So the, my question is, why haven't we found a good like Mario based platform? Yeah, like platformer? I said, like even just, oddly, I haven't all even seen a good like Mario Kart. Like the racing games they wrote don't tend to have the throw the bananas and stuff. Right. But I think that would be a board game. So that doesn't fall to the math guy Dave's question. That's just <laughs> me. But like, I, I don't know if you can do a good platforming video game or if you could, why would I care? Well, there is that. Like, it's all about dexterity and memory. Like the, the core, you have to look at what the core of a platformer is, is dexterity and memorizing maps. Like dying the first time because you didn't expect a thing, memorizing the map and knowing when to hit the buttons at the right time and timing. How do you put that into a board game and still make it fun? I, I just don't see if that's even possible. Fair. Yeah. I mean, again, how, how would you make a decent board game of Dragon's, uh, Dragon's Lair? 
<laughs> as we were talking about yeah. last week. You know, again, it's all about that split second. The game is about split second timing. Sure, there's a story there, but the story is 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 just a visual novel, uh, not a game. Uh, the game, the only game aspect is memorizing and tapping the buttons and, and joystick at the right time. Um, trying to think of other types. I, I was trying to think of most of the mobile game style, like most of the match threes. Yes, I know Potion Explosion exists. Exists. Potion Explosion does exist as a board game, which does do a bit of it. And I'm like, I think that's about as close as we're ever going to get. But I, I think a lot of those, stuff, like puzzle games, um, I don't even know, actually. I was thinking about like all those ones about parking cars and everything, but all those exist from Think Fun. Yeah, a where, lot where of you the, set up the map the match and game, you, the match games and the uh, the, the, the candy, match candy five, crush type the candy stuff. Crush. Those are designed to be a instant time waster when you mm-hmm. have five minutes on your phone and nothing else to do. That's their purpose, and so to make that into a board game requires a whole bunch of time and setup and effort and defeats the yeah. entire purpose of the genre of game. Yeah, I agree. And then Daniel in the chat's asking, didn't Potion Explosion start as a board game? Well, it is a board game, but it was based on uh, Candy Crush. So that was the idea. It was a match three. It was, you pull one thing out and then it causes a chain reaction as the marbles fall down and you get to collect more things. Now, I think they did make an app based on that, which is always, I, I always find that ironic. When you have like the game, the board game that gets made into a video game, gets made into a TV series, and then they release a board game based on the TV series. And I'm kind of like, there's already a game on that. What are you doing? Well, it's like the, it, it's, it's like the musical that gets made into a movie that gets made into a musical about the movie instead of about the original musical. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, other types. I've yet to see a good simulator. Like mm. like flight simulator. Give me like I uh, there are some war. I, OK, Sean's going to be at Origins. I'm going to have to show him this one game that he can take pictures and show his uncle because there there is a game with a wooden dashboard where they program their moves and everything that that's probably as close as you can get. That, that's a miniature war game though, but like, just like a flight simulator, uh, uh, the top gun, um, ACE combat that those style of games, again, I, I think fast paced action where you have to react and, you know, pull the trigger at the right time are really hard to put into, to at least pull over the feel in a board game. You end up with games like, you know, X-Wing and ACEs or what is it? Um, what's X-Wing based on wings of war. Yeah, it was based on Wings of War, where it's like hours to fight out 10 seconds of an aerial battle. Yeah, I mean, you get into some some strangeness where, again, a lot of video games, uh, especially when we're when we're moving into the arcade, are uh, agility, dexterity, reflex based games. If you're if you're playing some of the best games in the arcade, um, it's about reflexes and it's about Mm -hmm. your your manual dexterity. And a lot of that doesn't translate well into yeah. thinky, thinky board games, or you get into the problem where again, you're, it takes you so long to set it up and take it down that you've defeated the entire purpose. Which should lead me to another one, racing games where you're actually racing the car. There are mm-hmm. plenty of racing games out there, but none about driving. Yeah. Like actually controlling a car. I, and maybe there's one out there. I got to bet you again, some, someone could probably do something with cards. Yeah. Where, where you know you like you pick your gear you pick your this you flip a card to see what kind of turns coming up i, I think that could be done but yeah, in but general it's, it's maybe it's tough a solo because so many games are based on that top-down view where you know from the beginning where all the curves are and oh, where there, okay else. eggman jr is calling out the heat which i know is new hotness which i'm not trying to make a pun there <laughs> Heat is a new racing game everyone is scrambling for like people get excited when it's back in stock so there you go. Heat is, I just described heat. There you go. See, I am a game designer on my side. I just don't ever act upon it. So make no money off of these ideas. <laughs> so that, that's heat pedal to the metal, I assume. Yeah, that's yeah, the new manage one. to manage your race car speed to keep from overheating. Oh, there you go. So sounds like a battle tech game to me. Give me <laughs> a battle tech game where you can uh, play it, play real time like that. So yeah, the, uh, the, basically any action game, right? Like puzzle or action games are, are the big ones I think should never be ported over as board games. Now, if we want to talk about specific licenses, that's a little different. Um, most of the good ones are already done, except for like... Yeah, and licenses are different because you don't have to stick to the video game. You can yeah, just do something else within like, the license. Is there a good Zelda board game out there? I think Nintendo is probably just too scared of their license getting yeah. a bad rap if it comes out as a bad game. 
but I'm like, I can't think of a good Zelda game. Yeah, there are fighting games out there already. Those no, already actually, no, oh, no, there are some fantastic 2D fighters. My recommendation would be the um, oh, what is the name of it? I can picture it downstairs. War of Indines, the Indine series. The Indine series feel like you are playing a 2D fighter with all the combos. The Scott Pilgrim deck builder will give you an aspect of that. <laughs> um, if you want more of a Tekken strategic one, there's other games out there that do it. Um, there is a Street Fighter game that's supposed to be pretty good with real um, like pre-painted miniatures that look fantastic. But that opens it up. That's more like you're playing Street Fighter as a tactical war game. Yeah, and as yes. Darkening Bike points out, Nintendo and is Nintendo incredibly so... tight on their yeah. IP. So, uh, and something mean, like jumping back to the 2D, like Metroid, like the original Metroid, how would you even do that as a board game? Yeah, no, that's, and I mean, the original, original Metroid goes back so far. It, it's, well, I'm talking about back yeah. when it was, it was a platformer. Yeah. Like once you're, once you're going 3D, you're exploring worlds, you could probably pull something off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, there are some. Like when I first started, I'm like, there's none. Everything I can think of is already, I was thinking of specific games and everything I can make of was made into a game. But the more I think about it, there's actually quite a few things that video games do better. Uh, mm -hmm. The reactionary, anything that's reactionary. Well, and then, I mean, we've talked a number of and, times and on the show. There's a number of board games which should be made into video games and we can stop playing the board game. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's the opposite side. It, to be fair, it's like every board game. Someone should do a digital version because there's, there's about, very few. Well, no, because like Terraforming Mars is a bad video game experience. Yeah, but that, that, that means it was badly done. Yeah, like if it was on Board Game Arena, I bet you you'd have no problem with Terraforming Mars. Mm. Didn't have this like overly fancy interface. Possibly, but there's just something about being there and, and glancing around at everyone's cards and things like that. And yeah. it's Terraforming Mars part of what it is. Um, and, and while those mechanics were there, and even if they were badly implemented in that game, uh, the ability to just look around and see yeah. makes a huge difference. Yeah, like I wouldn't want to play Twilight Imperium digital for the same reason. Mm -hmm. It's just I want to be able to track every like look at people, walk around the table, look at where things are. Um, see people's player boards and how many counters they have left and all the other stuff too. Yep. No, all right, I think we're, I think we're wandering a bit at this <laughs> point. So, all right. So, uh, we got a follow up question here from the chat where darkling blight, uh, says with the increase in board games based on video game franchises, uh, <clears throat> Where is the, wait, I didn't write the full question. You didn't sorry. write the full question. So, so Dark, <laughs> Darkling Blight was just talking about, uh, we, we before the actual show started in one of our segments where we were talking to the chat, we were talking about the increase in board games based on video game franchises and just what do we think of it, right? Like, like is this good? Is this bad? And what he pointed out as a follow-up is like, that's a bit vague. And it's just, he feels weird when a video game plays different from a board game. So, like, he wants his video game franchise version or his board game version to feel like the, the video game. And most don't. And it seems strange to him. So some translate well and others don't. Yeah. But and I, I think to me, actually, that's that's part of the benefit of this. And that's part of why yeah. I think they do work. Um, again, Minecraft, I think, is a perfect example. Minecraft as a video game is an open world adventuring game or a fully creative designing game, whichever way you would like to play it. But when you distill it all the way down, it gets to be about uh, building in different areas, basically, and uh, builders mm -hmm. and biomes, which is the game they put out. And so they've stripped away all the wandering around and random combat bits and this and that and the other thing. And all you're doing is building with different biomes and different build styles and a little bit of combat. Cause there's always combat yep. there and just sort of distilled it down to that very, very basic kernel of what Minecraft is. And while, made a tossing in, while tossing in some neat thematic things to remind you it's Minecraft, like the block, yep, the yep. giant block that you pick from that just looks like a Minecraft. Block. Yeah, yeah. Like I just, mean, you're still just throwing you a physical block that you slowly <laughs> take apart. Yep. Yep. Really you're shipping blocks off the feel. block. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and well, I gotta say that one feels like it's missed in crafting because to me, Minecraft's all about the crafting. And, and, and I'm like, where that, I feel like that aspect's missing from that game. Now I know they did do an expansion, so maybe that adds that in uh, possibly, but at the same time, uh, crafting is a little bit, I mean, when, when Minecraft first came out, you had to memorize all of your crafting recipes. Yes. Nowadays it's a recipe book. Uh, there, there's okay. no, I mean, you, whatever you want to craft, as long as you've got the ingredients in your, in your inventory, it'll show you how to craft it. There's no, they've really kind of pulled back from okay. 
the crafting as a, a key Gubbery. component. Yes, yeah. it's something you have to do, but it's something that the game really holds your hand through anymore. You don't have to memorize that three wood across the top or, you know, three stone across the top and two wood down is how you build yep. a pickaxe. Yep. See, that, that shows how much I play it. When I played it, it was still all about, and no one told you, like you had to figure some oh, of yeah, these out. Yeah, it was random it was trial rolling, and error. Throwing things down onto the crafting table and, and hoping it worked. Yes. Definitely did a lot of that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I agree that, that I, in a way, I think it's better. I think, I think designers have realized that again, you can distill down the essence of the game without having to try to make it feel like you're playing the same game. And to me, that's how it's done right now. I'm sure other people probably disagree with that, but I'm thinking that's the right way to do it. But then in that case, uh, it, I think it only really works with games with licenses and and then like what evokes the feel of the license, not the gameplay of it, but what's happening in the world. What's the story? Not what are the mechanics of the video game? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a separation there. And and yeah, sometimes it translates, but anytime I played a board game, that's trying to accurately recreate what you do in a video game. It hasn't been great. Yeah. I'm my, my one that comes to mind recently, cause it's been a big thing recently is resident evil, right? Um, Resident Evil has some real specific, uh, feel to the game, some, uh, iconic characters, both good and evil. Um, and, and the video games, both on the PC and, you know, going right back to that standing up in the arcade with a gun, with the the gun in your hand, shooting, um, shooting things, you can't translate that or you could translate that into a board game, but I think it would be a boring board game. Uh, right. It just by trying to be accurate to the gameplay, you're losing something as uh, a board game. Yeah, which like the Doom games look really neat, but they're basically just another dungeon crawl, right? Like they're they're another descent, they're another Gloomhaven, they're another usually very dice heavy kill lots of monsters on a map game, which it just doesn't you don't get that feel of the video game from it. Though I guess you're moving on a map and shooting things. I don't know. I, it's a little odd because of that. I'm trying to think of other ones though. Um, that, that I'm trying to think of ones that actually fit, like that that are like as close as possible. Well, to be fair, Horizon, Civilization, well, Horizon Zero Dawn. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's again though. That's one that's not played at all. Like the game. Okay. They they took one nothing except for the fact that your your equipment are in arcs, the same arcs as they would be if you're pushing <laughs> up and down on the controller. There's really nothing like you saw me play a few seconds of Horizon Zero Dawn, a little longer than that. But like, I don't know. It doesn't feel like I'm playing Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't know. I, I, aspect, I didn't know if there was a hunt aspect of the game that 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 did. There is like you're playing again, you're playing part and the hunt is just one of those, you know, things you can do not required to finish the game. But if you're trying to 100 percent it and if you do all the hunts and, and shining star them all, you can get a special weapon that will, of course, make the game easier. And you get the, the you know, you get to become. Well, I thought the arc was going to be you get to be the head of the Hunter's Lodge, but you get to help some people advance in the Hunter's Lodge. And then there's a whole misogyny story arc there about women not being respected. Like, I don't get any of that from the board game. Right. Well, I'm, what I'm getting from the board game is I am going out and fighting monsters. <laughs> and it doesn't feel like the game because the board, the, the video game is all about sneaking and taking out as many as you can before they start attacking you. Whereas the board, you can't do it. No matter right. how many times we try, we maybe get one turn. Where we get in that one hit where a monster surprised. Right. So it doesn't even capture the feel of the combat on right. the board game. But it feels like I'm part playing part of Horizon Zero Dawn. So that's what it does right. But you don't get any of the dialogue. You don't get any of the story. You don't get, like, the game is also one of those branching paths, depending on what, you know, you have, excuse me, you can re- uh, reply to things either, uh, like, with your heart, uh, with your fists, or with your mind. Like, there's no aspect of that, and that changes the story. You don't get any of that. Like, it's just, it's such a small sliver. And honestly, it's kind of like a sliver that's happening completely separate from the game. Uh, the chat's asking uh, how super hot was as a translation. I don't think you've played the game or the oh, video game. I didn't even know that was a thing. So I did, I have played the video game. I have not played the card game. I've really heard mixed reviews about the card game uh some people think it does but i think the majority don't and it hasn't uh fared well uh ratings wise uh since its release okay. so i think overall uh they did made a good try of it 
but it, the game the game fell a little bit short. So here's a good one Ryan brought up actually is XCOM. I can't tell you if I think that one's good or bad. It's just not what I wanted. When someone says to me XCOM, I think tactical turn-based combat using action points. That's what I want to play. Yep. I want to I want to have my troops a couple of them die, I want to get through then I want to upgrade my squad with my spoils. That's what I want to play in an XCOM game and the board game is not that. The board game is zoomed out you're managing the world is you sitting at the world map mm. deciding giving the other players hey what are you going to research now what are you going to do where are we going to move our troops around the map oh a ufo showed up who do we want to send to intercept it it's all about so the, you're, the, the, shadow can- you're the shadowy council not yes. the actual commander not the commander that's mm. that's the feel i get from that like sean hasn't played it and he should because it's an xcom game but it just so wasn't what i wanted out of an xcom game now, when I teach the game to people, I'm like, look, if you enjoy the sit back, if, if you could t- put XCOM on auto battle, would you enjoy it? Because that's basically what this is. It's like you could turn on auto battle. And yes, there is a whole thing with building up your squad and you roll dice to see how you did it on your mission. But like your entire turn based, I spend two points to move forward. I spend another point to switch guns is abstracted by a bunch of D8 rolls, like three or four of them, depending on how many guys you have. Right. And it just wasn't what I wanted. But again... There's a designer going, what makes XCOM XCOM? And obviously to the group of people working on this game, it was all about managing the world and the threat to the world and allocating your forces and allocating your research. Where to me, XCOM's the best turn-based combat game ever played. And that's what I wanted to play on the board game. Well, I think it's probably interesting. Like who made XCOM? I don't, I don't, again, I don't know the game. Um, My, uh, it's Fantasy Flight. Okay. Because I'm to me, if Simon made XCOM, mm-hmm. That would be the game that the the video game is, Uh, whereas another company is going to take it in their own, their own twist in their own way. And again, Mm -hmm. there is that shadowy government that you could play. I I can see the, the interest of that and how everyone's got their own commanders that they're controlling and and things like that from this, that, that above level that you see in the game, but you don't take part in. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the abstraction makes sense. But again, I'm with Mo, that's not the game I'm, looking for yeah i want the simon the XCOM. XCOM yeah <laughs> game hey simon please put out an XCOM game where you can play through it because as eggman jr says in the chat funny when a board game is the perfect medium for doing turn-based action using action points why didn't they do it yeah um weird tangent i still think XCOM stole its system from fasa first edition role-playing or star trek star trek sean played star trek with me i'm like it felt like playing XCOM. You literally had a number of action action points and it cost half a point to turn and it cost this many points to pull your phaser. And, and, and I got to say it felt out of place in a Star Trek game, but I'm like, man, this is one of the best action point based combat systems I've ever played through. Unfortunately, it means that it takes three hours to play through a quick phaser fight, but it did a really good job. And I'm like, why didn't they use this for XCOM? Right. Uh, uh, that's possible. So Ryan, Ryan's making a good point. If if Fantasy Flight game had done units on a map, would have gotten lost among all the other area control military management games. The thing is, it's not area control. It would be a co-op game, you versus the aliens, and it's all about capturing objective points. Or like you would probably have a deck where you draw what is your objective, uh, save the hostages, um, whatever, turn on the teleprompters or whatever, or free free the the humans that have been enslaved, or investigate this building. And you would play through that cooperatively, which probably each person controlling a different squad member instead of I, I can't see it being a competitive game unless one versus many. Yeah, I like can see one versus play many. the aliens. Yeah, I can definitely see one versus many as a possible option. Uh, although I think that in this day and age, you'd want to have it as a one versus many or maybe an app driven. Yeah, um, I would think I would think app driven is probably better nowadays, but. So yeah, Galaxy Defenders, exactly. I, that's that's a good example of that style of game. The um, Space Alert. It's a Space Alert? What what was... I'm trying to remember the name. It's a series of games from Stronghold Games. Um, and the, the, the original was a real time. And it was everyone took a different role on the ship. You each played like you were a Star Trek bridge crew. And then there was part two. There was a dice game. And then they put out a miniature game, battle game. Space, space cadets, cadets. Is it? So Space Cadets, whatever the mini away missions. I think it's Space Cadet away missions might be the miniature game. I think that's more what we wanted. 
Now it doesn't use action points quite the same. Like there's more to it. Yeah, I did get it. Space Cadets Away Mission was the one I was thinking of. Now I will say we're kind of again off <laughs> on a tangent here about games um fitting game mechanics in a board game actually matching the the mechanics, I guess we'll call them the the way a board a video game plays. And like I said, I think that way is folly. Like if you can pull it off, great. But I think what you need to do if you're designing a board game version of a video game is distill down what that's about. Like Sean's pointed out a couple of times already, figuring out what's Minecraft all about. It's all about building things, exploring the world, making it so your areas are safe, building things that that are that work well together, pos- fighting a few creepers. Like if you put all that in a game. And like I said, the chiseling away at the block is, is I think the real, that, that was the, the cherry on top that yeah. like, okay, now, no matter what, this feels like Minecraft because I'm picking blocks off this giant block. Yeah. It, 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 it sort of, uh, polished off the, the theming of the idea you had building and you had, you know, your biomes and you had a little of combat, but until you actually, you know, were, were punching a tree or punching, <laughs> punching a, wa- a rock wall to get a, a, yes. a cube out, uh, that, you know, that made it there Minecraft. You go. We're going to change the game so that now you have to get the axe from Tic Tac Lumberjack and you have to actually knock them off and then just to get that extra level of immersion. So another example, and we were talking about this already about games that, that switch back between mediums, is Civilization. Mm-hmm. That is one of the, I, uh, the Avalon Hill Civilization, I think was the original. And then there was Sid Meier Civilization. Then there were the Civ computer games. And then there were board games based on the computer games. And then there were computer games that are now based on one of the series of board games. It was just a mess. But those try fairly successfully to give you the feel, but realize that a computer can do a heck of a lot of stuff in the background that no human can. And no set of cards is going. So again, they did. Well, it started off as a board game, so they didn't distill anything down at that point. But Civ back then abstracted things a lot. It, It was actually a lot of a negotiation game with your other players kind of like diplomacy more than it was, but the tech tree was a huge part of it, right? And then, well, the board game kind of went, well, we could take that tech tree and we can make it huge and we can add in events based on timelines and we can have people go up at different levels the video and you can game, find ways. Hmm? The video game, not the board game. Yeah, the video game and, and make it its own thing, right? But then literally I have downstairs Civilization New Dawn, which is a board game based on one of the video games. And they keep going back and forth, but I think they do really try to to keep the basic feel like they they all kind of feel like Civ, right. whereas that's not how you have to do it. So a perfect example is through the ages, a new story of civilization giving you the exact same story, the exact same gameplay experience of starting off with nothing, building up with different players, leveling up and and getting different uh, levels of technology at different times and having their interacting. But it's all done with cards, and it it feels so different from moving your little donkey or whatever, whatever is camel on the map to found a new civilization, right? Like it just feels while still getting that same overall civilization feel. Oh, and then you move on to something like tapestry, which really isn't that different than yep. <laughs> that, but is a completely different game. Completely different. Despite being that the distills same it down to just the tech tree. Like, yes. Okay. There's a little bit of map going on, but a little bit of map going on. Tech tree, the board game, <laughs> and not and beyond the sun. Um, and of course, and someone's already called out how bad the Masters of Orion board game was at recreating the video game series. And I, I got to agree because I don't know what they were trying to distill down. <laughs> like, like, I don't get it. Like, what, what part of Moo is, what were you trying to get? I'm like, it's sci-fi. It's 4X kind of. Um, it did some good things about making it so you can't eliminate other players and you only get points for, like, they limited attacking. And it's a neat, quick playing sci fi 4X game. But like the only thing about that that says Master Ryan are the races. And you guess even there, they messed up and had two of the names wrong based on the images. So, like, I, I don't know what they were trying to distill down. I would love to see a Moo game, but I think it exists in Space Empires 4X. Right. Like, I think it's been done. It just, it's been done by GMT. And despite the fact I say I want to play Moo the board game, I don't think I actually do want to play move the board game with all the chits and all the counters and all the possible upgrades and all the spread cheating that goes with it. Like there's a reason the game's popular as a video game. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's interesting to me. I'm, I'm interested in knowing how Stellaris uh, plays as a video game 
because or as a board game as because a board game. it's a 4x i mean it, it, there's no reason it couldn't they're going to have to simplify some stuff because again you don't have the computing power to do all the aliens in the background and, and you know the the entire economy of the universe playing out in mm -hmm. the shadows but uh realistically you should be able to do a pretty interesting version of it they've already got a couple of expansions on for it so stellaris is one that may translate well into the board game um i'm i the the ratings are are a little low but they're still it's still early there's only a 124 ratings so it's hard to say uh it's only just out this year so yeah personally i i until something's gonna have to have to, to do something new significantly new because as far as i'm concerned 4x sci-fi games are done like i don't need a new one if i want euro -y quick play in three hours but still feel like i built a civilization i'll play eclipse second on if i want an all-night experience that involves negotiation and trading with other players and isn't about just taking over everywhere i'll play twilight imperium and then if i want the full-on start off as a star base take over the universe play for three weekends in a row and leave the game set up in between and take moves every week. I'll play space empires 4 X. I kind of feel like the breadth has been done there. And to me, it's going to take something pretty big to break into that. Well, it's interesting because I mean the, 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 what, what they're claiming Stellaris is, is essentially it's twilight Imperium in two hours. So it's, it's the, it's the big galactic battle with new diplomacy distilled but down they, to two hours. So I wonder if they play Galactic Emperor because Galactic Emperor is Twilight Imperium in two hours, including the eight different roles and you pick a role and everything's abstracted more and there's less dice rolling. No one's known. They, we, I always forget that when we talk about hidden gem games, man, remind me of Galactic Emperor. Now I think it's out of print now, but Galactic Emperor is that, that, that was their design goal was Twilight Imperium in one to two hours. And it was one of uh, Neil's group's favorite games for a while and totally sold me on it. I love it. Because it, it really did. It felt like playing Twilight Imperium in under two hours. Right. Like there's enough little ones in there. Like there's Exodus, Proxima Centauri, right? It's another hex base. It kind of looks like Twilight Imperium. And what it adds to the genre is the planets have depleting resources. So you really get the exploitation feel because when you go to a new sector, you roll the die to see how many resources are on there. And every time you bleed the planet, you got to roll the die down. So it added something that's not in the other games. But that was their, their shtick, right? And then there's Hegemony. Um, I can't remember the full name. It's hegemony something, something galaxy or something. That one was all about being able to take over other planets through socialization and your prosperity and your culture. So it added that whole aspect of your galaxy could spread without using ships. And there's lots of games that do little pieces of it, but I don't think you'll ever beat those other ones for like the all encompassing got kind of everything going at once. So Galactic Emperor is, yes, I'm very much out of print, but yeah. it has been supplanted by Empire of the Stars, which re implements okay. Galactic Empire. I'm going to have to check that out. Out in 2021 by Crosscut Games, who I'm not familiar with. Yeah, I'm not familiar. I, okay, I want to try that now. That There's a wish list item for me right then, because Galactic Empire really did. Like, you even had the, like, one of the big things is in Twilight Imperium that it isn't carried over in any of the others, is the initial round of selecting your role. And it's one of those, depending on what roles are selected, the person who selected it's going to get a bonus and everyone gets to do a thing. And if no one chose the trade role, no one gets to trade. It still has that aspect, which is why it really feels like Twilight Imperium. So the same publisher is Kadashi. Uh, oh, and they are the publisher of Galactic Emperor. Uh, so yeah. oh, okay. Galactic so, yeah, Emperor was 2008. Was, so they're still around. That's and good they just, they, they've brought out a new version of it in 2021 called Empire of the Stars. Okay. I got to check that out. I'm going to have to get you to drop a link later so I can take a look at that. because. I am really curious because Galactic Emperor is good and I don't have a copy because I couldn't find it even back then. Right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move on to the next question. Now, this is from long-term fan of the show. She's in the chat, though the question wasn't asked in chat. Um, Pax the Paladin has asked. Um, this question was inspired by our Sorcerer's Arena coverage as well as the recent Spiel the Jar nominations, um, particularly Dwarf Romantic, I think. Dwarf Romantic. Um which is what's a mobile game you'd like to see turned into a board game. How might the designer take advantage of multiple players and in interaction when adapting the game for the table? Now this probably could be a whole topic, but I thought we talked about it a lot, but I got to say straight up, I am not the person to talk to about mobile games. I <laughs> barely play mobile games. I have a copy of uh, Marvel puzzle quest that I've had 
and been playing since I got my first iPod Touch years ago. And I still have an account, and I'm about to um, champion my first five-star character, hopefully tonight. That is pretty much my limit of playing mobile games. So, yes, I saw this. Like, like Dwarf Romantic looks really neat. And Deanna and I were looking at it. We're thinking of buying the video game version just because it looks really cool. Because it looks like like a super advanced, really cool-looking Carcassonne where you're laying down tiles, building things. And, and the board game even has some like awesome um, legacy elements where you're opening packs of cards that unlock new types of tiles and new terrain types. Looks great, but I've never played the mobile game. And earlier, just I, how long ago was it that Sean just said, I played the game, but Mo's never heard of it. <laughs> I, I haven't kept up to even tell you a mobile game that should be turned into a board game because I can't think of any. No, that's very fair. Uh, I am trying desperately to remember the name of a specific game that I have on. Uh, okay, well, one, I mean, Slay is one that's that's I think has been probably done a thousand times. Uh, Slay is literally, you know, it's, it's, um, Othello, uh, but with multiplayer okay. <laughs> and, and knights, uh, basically that's, that that's kind of, cool. that's kind of all that is. So Slay probably has been done in some form or other, but there's a specific galactic game whose name is escaping me. And I, uh, it, it's on, it's, it's on, it's on the tablet I'm using for yeah. my teleprompter. So trying to look figure out, oh, well. um, what it is, but basically what it is, is, um, you're playing against X other, uh, opponents and you, uh, your planets are putting out ships. Uh, all the ships are the same. So every ship is exactly the same. And, uh, in the game, it's actually a music based game. And on the beat, your planets put out more ships okay. and then you move those, pla- those ships to other, either un- uh, unoccupied planets to occupy them and have them creating more ships or to occupied planets to destroy them and turn them into your occupied planet. It's really pretty basic. Um, and obviously you wouldn't be using the music based aspect of well, it, no. but, but just generating resources to take over other things in a quick, fast paced back and forth. Uh, mm. you know, everyone is creating the same number of, uh, at, at the beginning, everyone is creating the same number of resources per turn. Uh, and it's only how you manage those resources, whether or not you have the edge to take over and timing and, you know, backstabbing sounds, and all that sort it, of thing. It sounds a lot like eminent domain. So eminent domain is not quick. Right. But like you just, you make fighters, right? You you make <laughs> fighters, then you use them to either peacefully take over a planet or conquer planets that then can make you more fighters. Right. So there's the whole tech tree aspect of uh, eminent domain there. And like I said, it's not quick. The eminent domain, it can be a long, hard game. Yeah. Whereas this one is literally, I mean, this one can go on forever because you can get into sort of stalemates, but uh, it's, it's just about, you know, just building up and, and attacking and trying to time it time things correctly so that if you know player x is going after player y player z can sneak in behind and and right scoop the planet from out from under them sort of thing interesting i i don't know the the only thing i can think of is remember the old starfleet game we used to play mm-hmm. you remember what it was yeah. called yeah no i don't know but i know what you mean it, it wasn't called starfleet um it was a facebook game that we were really into for a long time we actually ran the number two guild on the entire server that we were on I kind of like to see something like that, which I know a lot of people played it on mobile, but I don't even remember the name of it. I know Charles still plays whatever the latest iteration of it is. It was like Galactic Empire or something like that, but it was all about you started off with one planet and it produced resources over time. And then you use those resources to make ships and your ships kind of sucked at first. You can only afford the cheap ones. Then you would send them to nearby planets to try to raid them. And if your ships ever end up somewhere with someone else's ships, they fought. Right. And there was some kind of system in the background that worked. I would love to see that in a board game format just for the scope. Like there were thousands of galaxies like that. You didn't have the map. It'd be just like, I don't know, here's a card row of all the planets and you'd pick which card to go after and right. you put your ships on it. And then your opponent would move their ships. And I don't know, I don't know about a real time element, but maybe something because the big thing in that game was ninjing people and fleet saving, which was you would send your ships to another planet very far away with all of your resources on it so that when you weren't actively playing the game, if anyone raided your planet, they just got whatever you generated in those couple of hours. And then when your ships were halfway there, you turn them to turn back. And like, really it was an exploit, but it's what everyone did. Right. We used to call it fleet saving. You would say, you would literally turn all your resources in the ships and fly them away so that when they came back, they were there to use to actually improve your planets and stuff. Right. Um, I would love to say it wasn't Stellaris. 
I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, if, so if I Aura, go through my old Facebook posts, I can probably find it. Aura Lux Constellations is the game I was thinking of from Wardrum. Wow, that's quite the name. Wardrum Studios. Um, quite the name. That's A U R A Lux Constellations. Um, Here, drop a link to that in the notes, and we'll throw that in the 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 sh- the, the much vaunted show notes later for people <laughs> to find. Um, I only have the. Uh, or even the name the android, I, I, the android, I have the android link it's just not that i don't have the there we go. i don't have the i the i links i so I only what, what the next part of pax's question probably could be a full episode is how might the designer who's taking a mobile game and putting it to um on the table take advantage of multiple players and adapt and, and interaction when adapting the game so what's funny is most of the mobile games we were just talking about are already big multiplayer yeah. games where hundreds <laughs> or thousands of people can play them. So that's a different take on it than I was thinking. I think Pax is more thinking of the single player mobile games. How would you adapt them? But again, I I need a specific example of an app I played. And I, well, I'm wondering I one out. thing that I haven't seen and, and I'm interested to know if it's even possible. And, and I, again, I don't know if we're the place to, to write, discuss this. I'm sure there are, uh, board game design podcasts who could go deep on this topic and and I welcome them to have it uh, if they're interested, but how you take the idle games. Yeah, right? I was thinking about that when we were talking about games that wouldn't port, you know, you've, you've like, got this concept of idle games, which are a huge deal. And I have played and occasionally do still play far more of them than I would like to admit. <laughs> um, but you know, there's something to them. I play them on steam. I've played them on mobile. There's something about, idle games that can be fun and i wonder if that's something you can turn into a multiplayer game which would be bizarre because it completely defeats the purpose of what an idle game is it, it turns turning it into multiplayer work well, when it's actually single the, player nothing i think the big thing there is um the the resource generation over time based on real time and I think that's what you need to capture. So like take any game, any Civ game. Uh, I can't think of a good example. And even where instead of your stuff generating on a die roll, they automatically generate, but every half hour and you literally leave the game set up or you don't play for a couple weeks and then come back to the table and you set it up and go, how long has it been since we last played? Okay. It's been nine days. So look up the progression chart <laughs> based on your granary level. You're going to get two food for every day based on, it would be an interesting idea for like more of a legacy style game. I think or a well, campaign I, I'm style actually, game. I'm actually wondering about, um, something more like, um, gizmos is coming to mind where you've got, you know, something that's feeding out resources, right? Okay. The, you think I'm thinking the gizmo, the gizmos ball deliverer uh, right. thing and something like that. And so you're not playing real time. You need to be turn based, I think. But you know, turns and uh, turns can, depending on on whatever mechanic, be either a day or a month or a week. Yeah. And and so the actual time length, time of turn grows. So each you know, whereas we're used to a round being always the same, right? Every every round is a month, or every round is a week, or every round is a day, or or a minute. Whereas in this game. The first round might be a minute, but the 10th round might be a year okay. and, and everything would scale, right? So your resources mm-hmm. would scale along with that. Um, and that, that, because again, that's, you know, the, the exponential scaling is really what idle games are about. Okay. And so a way of capturing that in. See, I was also thinking if you did a time track, now I'm thinking of the initiative track from Feng Shui, the, the, the RPG here or champions also uses a similar one. Where it starts off and there's 10 time slots. And when you first start, your resources generate on number five because you have whatever the basic farm. And then you play through one, two, three, four. People are doing other stuff. And on five, hey, you get more wood. But then later you improve your granary and now you get it on two and five. And then later you get it on this. And by the end of the game, maybe you get it at every time stamp, but you have one of those for all your resources. You generate new troops on two and eight and you generate and then throw like, I don't know, a Civ game on top of it. <laughs> But anyway, we could probably we could probably go on about this and design half a game here as we go on. So what I am going to do though is I am going to shout out the fantastic Suzanne Sheldon. If anyone wants to know anything about apps and board games and integration one way or the other, 
Um, Suzanne is the app master of, of the table tabletop gaming industry. Um, she is a content creator on her own, as well as with the Dice Tower, who actually maintains a list of board game apps um, and board game related, like apps that are basically board games like Slay the Spire. So if you want to know about apps, like I, I'm going to defer to the real expert here <laughs> and say, check out Suzanne. Easy enough to find uh, Dice Tower. She's very active still on Twitter, surprisingly, because a lot of people aren't. Um, I don't know if she has a blog or anything like that, but it definitely on her Twitter account is a link to her lists. Um, if you want to know anything or recommendations, like I, I think if you asked, if, if Pax asked Suzanne, what's a mobile game you'd like to see turned into a board game in seconds, she'd be like, oh, boom, this and this and maybe this. And I played this one. She's also the master of roll and write. So if you want to know about roll and write games, that's the other, the other one to hit her up on. All right. Then. I think we'll do one more question. I'm I'm tempted to not just because like our whole topic today has been integration of video games. Like it's basically through multiple different questions <laughs> done about video games and board games and the crossover between them. And okay, well, the, the I one... have I have one more follow up then. Okay. So Brian Eckholt asks has asked, are there any good mobile versions of cardboard games? They have flux and ascension. Ascension is good, flux is okay. So here we go okay, again, keeping on the, keeping on the digital, digital divide. All right. Again, I'm going to say, uh, go talk to Suzanne. <laughs> like, look at <laughs> Suzanne's list. I, I am nowhere near an expert on this. And the information I'm going to give you is probably five to 10 years old. So I have a number of fantastic mobile versions of games that I think are worth getting, but I don't, haven't played a new one um, in five years, at least like I haven't <laughs> downloaded a new one. So the ones I will recommend, Ascension is fantastic. Ascension, uh, they, Jones Theory, the board game. I will probably never play the board game again because the Ascension app is so good. Similarly, Star Realms. Star Realms is fantastic on the app, including a single-player campaign that I'm actually replaying through currently because somehow I lost my dang save data. <laughs> but somehow switching from Apple to Android, I wasn't able to, like, even though I have a, I don't know what the company is, Direwolf Digital, I think it is, account. For some reason, it didn't port my info. So that part stinks. But yeah, Star Realms is fantastic. I've heard the other Realms games like Hero Realms and Epic are also good, but I haven't played them. Small World, to me, is better on a tablet. No, a tablet doesn't work well on a phone. But if you have a tablet, I would rather play Small World on that tablet. It's technically the app is Small World 2 because they released one that wasn't so great. So they released a follow up and called it 2, which confuses people because they think it's like part 2 where it's really it's the same game. What I love about that is that feels like a virtual tabletop game because your piles of chits are in front of you and you literally just drag them with your finger into the areas you want to attack. And it manages all the fiddly stuff, like having to remember to put gold on the civilizations that weren't taken every turn and shuffling all the tokens every round and even remembering things like, oh, that has a fortress there. So therefore this happens. I, I would much rather play Small World 2 than the any version of the Small World board games. Uh, I've got a few actually, uh, cause I play a little more often. Uh, suburbia is a fantastic yep. digital implementation that for me, especially has solo missions essentially that you play mm -hmm. through that are just great. Uh, Jaipur. Now, unfortunately this app has not been kept up to date. Yeah. That means, which means it works perfectly fine, but because the code hasn't been evolving along with the OSs. Sometimes it can be hard to install on some devices. So you may, your, your luck may vary when it comes to Jaipur, unfortunately. Uh, Takedo. Yep. Wonderful. I was going to call that one out. Wonderful mobile It app. looks so good. It does. It really You actually does. get like the people walking on the paths. It, it makes Takedo Zen again. Yep. Uh, and then uh, my final call out. Now, I haven't played this on mobile, but I've played it on like every other platform. And that's Carcassonne. Carcassonne is a great tabletop game and it's a great social game, but the game is actually, except for that social aspect, way better in the digital versions. They have added so many fantastic features and, and you know, quality of life features into that digital version that you can turn on or off as necessary. That unless you really need that, you know, sitting around at a table playing Kark, which I will not de deny is a, is a great experience the digital is a better game. 
So I still like Kark in person. So I, the well, yeah, Kark has social. been fantastic we, since the Xbox version. Yeah, we've talked like, about like the, the social good. the social stuff, and I think we're gonna we're gonna talk about it again in the upcoming review about yeah. how social. Uh, even if you're not actually sitting back and relaxing and, and chatting throughout the game, the it's social the aspect the is a big part of gaming for us. But okay, other other board game apps that are great. Onitama? No, what's is that the name? Onitama, the two-player martial arts duel. Yeah, Do yeah. I have the right name? I, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm grabbing my phone so everyone at home can watch. Yes, Onitama. Because I have some installed. Not all, but I have some. So Onitama is fantastic on the app because it has all of the different cards that you can get from the expansions as well as all the different, different um, like the, the, the weasel and the ninja and all the other stuff that's on there. You can change up the board. It is just like sitting and playing the real thing. I will admit, I prefer playing the real thing. There is something about the spatial relation of actual pieces I'm touching that works on my brain better. I'm terrible on the app for some reason. Like I get outplayed all the time and I'm like, I totally didn't see that. So there is a difference there, but it's done extremely well. Um, let's just see what I have installed right now. So uh, <laughs> patchwork, patchwork is fantastic on the app. I would rather play patchwork on the app. So we talk about date night games all the time or, or bar and coffee shop games that my wife and I play. I no longer pack patchwork. It's here on my phone and we will go to a coffee shop and we'll play pass and play with my phone more often than we'll put out the big game. Because Patchwork, unfortunately, despite being what should be a small footprint game, that initial circle of tiles is huge yeah. and doesn't fit on most coffee tables. Absolutely. I have Takedo, which you already called out. I have Star, Star Realms as well. So that's what I have installed right now is Patchwork, Takedo, Onitama, Star Realms, and then a bunch of like, I have the Gloomhaven Helper, but <laughs> that's not really an app version of Gloomhaven. Now, I have heard other ones are good. Um, Eggman Jr. is calling out the Splendor app. I have heard that's good. I have not played it myself. Um, again, Suzanne Sheldon uh, it's, is definitely worth checking their list. They, 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 they keep up with this, <laughs> this kind of thing. Whereas, yeah. like I said, most of the games I'm mentioning here are fairly old at this point. I want a, a version, an app version of War Chest, and I want an app version of The Duke, but I don't think either exist. So now here's a different topic. What are board games we wish we had apps for? Yeah, um, Duke, Duke, definitely. Absolutely. I would love to have a, a Duke implementation. I'm surprised it hasn't shown up on BGA as well. um, similarly. Yeah, it's true. That is true. Um, oh, Eggman's talking about upgrades. I, I will say I did not enjoy the Flux app, but I don't like Flux. I found the app even worse. <laughs> so <laughs> I did not. I did have that one installed. I'm trying to think of which ones I've uninstalled. Like, is there a way to look at your Google Play, like everything you own? Yeah, I'm on it right now, actually. My play.google.com slash library slash games. Okay, let, let me take a look and see if I can find others, because this is, this I'm is at, an I'm AMA. Like, Carmageddon. Can we get a good a, another good board game of Carmageddon? Because we used to have one. It's up on your shelf behind you there somewhere. There, there's been a few over the years that have tried. Uh, yeah, Thunder tried. Road just came out. Thunder Road. Everyone just got it. Is that Carmageddon, though? Is that? Eh, sort of. Yeah, it looks like it's more Carmageddon now than it used to be. Yeah, true. There you go. So, how do I look at what I own? So, I'm under games. So, I'm I'm on it's it's library. So, play play.google.com slash library. Library and devices. Okay, and then and then just go to games. Mm, 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 games. Let's see if we have any IRs there. I forgot about. Nope. Nope. Ascension called that out. Yep. Catan, yeah, it was yeah. okay. Yeah, it's Catan. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Catan, you need. I, Catan's a game. I think you need to play in person. Right. You, you need to negotiate with people while you're negotiating with people. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a lot. Gang of Four. So, which, I mean, it, I, has anyone has anyone in the chat played Plague Inc? Because Plague, I got I got hooked on pandemic. Plague Inc. way early on as an app, and then they made it into a board game. And then the people who made the app made the board game. Yes. Um, but I don't know if it was any good or not. And, and it was a fantastic. It was game. extremely popular, but I just didn't see the reason when I had pandemic. Well, yeah, I mean, but I mean, to be, to be like the, the app was, was better. Well, it's, it's also the opposite, right? You're trying yeah. to infect, not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eggman like, just got the maximum Chrome uh, Thunder Road show up on his doorstep today. Oh, see, I wish I could have afforded it. I mm -hmm. wish I could have. 
So Gang of Four is really good if you like Gang of Four. Gang of Four is a, a ladder-based card game with a lot of quick play. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's kind of like Mahjong, the card game, in a way. It's got that <laughs> kind of feel back room. You should be betting real money right. to be able to play it. That was that was well done. So I have that one. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh God, World of Yoho. <laughs> yeah, that's that was a board game that needed an app. Hmm. Marvel Snap is a great implementation of Smash Up. <laughs> <laughs> Onitama. Yeah, I don't have a lot. Thought there'd be more, but there aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, technically, there is a version of Robo Rally that was really good, but it wasn't official. So I'm not going to tell you the name. Mm-hmm. Sentinels of the Multiverse that is a great example of a game that was better as an app because Sentinels of the Multiverse. I really like Sean had a bad experience, but that's my fault because <laughs> we threw in some characters that shouldn't have used. Just stuck to the base box. But in Sentinels of the Multiverse, at least the original version, I hear the new revised re-up, whatever they call the latest edition, the essential edition or whatever, is, is has fixed this. But there's so many things you had to track. Like what powers you've used, what hasn't been used, all your pluses, minuses. And the board game came with all these little, they look like comic book panel like you know where it would say c issue whatever it would say you know plus one defense and tracking all that was terrible and they fixed all that by putting out the app plus the app added a campaign and a story and it's fantastic except it's feels like it should be better on a tablet it's a little small for what it is yeah and actually that's one thing i the one problem i personally had with my eyesight for um suburbia was I prefer playing it on the seven inch tablet, tablet or yeah. eight inch tablet rather than the, you know, four and a half inch phone or whatever it is. Um, just that little bit of extra thing made mm-hmm. it more readable for me. Uh, if you've got greater eyes, your mileage may vary. So yeah, suburbia. No, what else is really good? Ticket to ride. That's the one place I like playing ticket to ride is, is ticket to ride on. I can finish an entire game of ticket to ride in about 15 minutes, <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes on the app. And the computer is good. Like this is if you want to prove to yourself you can play Ticket to Ride well that it's not just random cards and rummy, play the computer version and try to play on on the anything but the first two difficulties and see just how well Ticket to Ride can be played and why you can have a Ticket to Ride tournament and it works. Yeah, Ticket to Ride app is fantastic. Um, Days of Wonder does like all their games. Like I think you can get Shogun and everything in app version, but I never tried them. Right. All right. At that point, um, I don't know if there's anything in the chat because I've been looking at my Google. No, I think that's about enough questions for tonight. So thank you to everyone who sends us questions. And thanks to you awesome folk here in the lobby for taking part tonight and giving us so much to talk about. So speaking of questions, when looking for short topics to talk about tonight, which we only pulled one from the question base, so that was awesome. Often we have to grab a couple before the chat room starts going, but they jumped right in. So thank you very much, chat room. But I did realize while looking for short form questions that we don't have as many as we used to. Uh, the, the the question pile is getting a little low and could use a refresh. So if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, we could use some more right now. Get those questions to us by heading to tabletopbellhop.com, clicking on Ask the Bellhop. You can email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. You can send me a message on your social media platform or choice, or you can do what PAX did today, which was fantastic, and drop them in the Tabletop Bellhop Discord, which you can find at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Basically, any way you want to get them to us, we'll take them. But we could use a refresh at this point. Like, it's not like we're a pink. It's like, like we've got some questions. We're not going to run out, but I would love to see some new ones and um, especially some short form for the next time we decide to do something like this. We got some great long deep dive types of topics and we got people looking for lists of games but we could use a few short questions as well it's time for us to take a look at siege of valeria a solo dice game from daily magic games whom we have to thank for sending along a review copy siege of valeria was designed by a friend of the show glenn flaherty better known by some as the dude behind board games and bourbon it features artwork from, who would have guessed it, The Miko, and was published in 2022 after a rather successful Kickstarter. Siege of Valeria is a single-player game that takes under an hour to play, even for your first learning game, and which gets quicker the more you play and get used to the cards and mechanics. It's recommended for ages 8 up, which seems about right to us, depending on the 8-year-old, as this isn't a light game, 
and there's lots of moving parts to keep track of. So Siege of Valeria is a castle defense board game where you must defend a fortress at Valeria's southernmost border from hordes of monsters and their nasty siege engines. Defeat wave after wave of enemies in an effort to destroy the last siege engine before a section of your wall falls. This game was a 2022 Golden Geek Best Solo Game nominee. Check out the components in this Golden Geek nominated single player game on our Siege of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube. There you'll see the very clear and concise rule book with lots of detailed examples, lots of graphics, lots of pictures, and reference information for every single card in the game, which is great to see. You're going to get lots of square cards for the evil hordes and siege engines, smaller event and champion cards, a long skinny board, and a variety of different tokens. You also get a rather large number of custom dice in two colors. The component quality overall is good. The iconography used is very clear and the various tokens are all unique wooden shapes that are easy to tell apart and match the shapes and symbols used in previous Valeria games. Mm -hmm. This consistency across games is something we always appreciate. Now one small bonus I personally really liked is that the dice here are pretty much standard D6 dice with one to six on the various sides, but instead of just round pips, there's are small symbols that actually match the iconography and tokens. I just thought that was a nice touch. Now, while it would be nice if the card text were a bit bigger, you do quickly get to know the cards by their artwork, and after a couple of plays, this isn't much of a problem. Now that you have some idea of what you're getting, let's dive into how to use all these dice and cards with an overview of play. So a game of Siege of Valeria is won by defeating every card in the Siege Engine deck, which involves destroying the ones that are out at the start of the game, as well as the ones that are still in the deck that will come out during play. This has to be done before any siege towers remain in the front row during activation. Or you've taken four damage, represented by flame tokens, or the enemy troop deck runs out. And that is way more ways to lose than ways to win. You start off a game by building the battlefield. You lay out the board, shuffle the troop deck, remove two from the game just so you make sure you don't have perfect information, deal two cards to yourself as a starting hand, and then build a four by five grid out in front of the board with four cards lined up in front of each of the five turrets on the boards. You then shuffle the siege engine deck and deal out five of these at the top of each column so you end up with a battlefield that starts off five by five. Shuffle the champion and event deck and grab the dice. At the start of the game, you only get five red soldier dice and two blue holy dice. You can earn more of these during play, so set the rest of the dice and all the tokens to the side and you're ready to start. So each round, you will roll all of your earned dice, the ones that you've, you've gotten during the game, and then you're going to resolve all of the siege engines in play. Now, the cards for these each list five different ranges, and in each range, there's a number there that is how much power you need to defeat the siege engine. Well, that number will either be black or highlighted. If a siege engine is currently at a highlighted range, the card goes off, doing some kind of terrible thing to you like causing you to lose dice, re-rolling your highest dice, reducing the number of dice you have, causing damage to your turrets, and more. Now, assuming you survive this assault, you then flip over the top event card and resolve this. The game, however, suggests skipping these for your first few games, which makes sense as most of them are negative effects, making the foes you are facing even tougher. Some are positive, though, so don't despair each time you have to draw one. After the event is resolved, you get to start fighting back. Now, this is done by spending dice from your just rolled dice pool and playing cards from your hand. In general, you have to spend as many pips on as many number of dice you want equal to or higher than a target card's cost to defeat. Some enemies, though, are magical troops and require that you spend a blue holy die in order to defeat them. Now, cards in your hand can be spent to add pips, reroll dice, double die numbers and more. And really, the main chunk of this game is figuring out what dice to use and what cards to spend. That is the meat of this game is figuring out that puzzle. When attacking, unless you have a card that says otherwise, you can only attack troops that are in the front row, closest to the castle walls. Siege engines can be attacked almost any time, though they generally get easier to defeat the closer they get to your castle. When you defeat any enemy, you get to take that card into your hand, where it can be spent at any time, even right after you take it. Now, when you defeat a card, you may also earn some type of immediate bonus. 
These include gaining strength or magic tokens to boost your attacks, defeating additional adjacent enemies, or in the case of siege engines, you get to earn a champion. Champions represent powerful troops fighting on your side. When you gain a champion, you draw the top card from the deck and then must place it onto one of the five turrets on the board. Each champion gives you some form of powerful ability. Most of these can only be used once per turn. Additionally, any champion can be spent to remove an impact token from the turret they are in, but this removes the champion from play. After you're done spending all your dice and cards, the Vanguard attacks. Now, the Vanguard is the cards that are still in the front row, right next to your castle walls. Now, each card just does one impact damage to the turret it's in front of and is discarded. So remember, if any single turret takes four damage, you do lose the game. Once the vanguard is cleared, you advance the battlefield. Everything slides down as far towards the castle as it can, and then it's time to add new troops. Any column without a siege engine gets a new one, a new siege engine added to that back row, and four new troops are drawn from the deck, whether there's room for them or not. Remember, you lose if this deck ever runs out. And lastly, any newly added siege engines slide up as close as they can. Now, assuming you haven't lost, play continues with you rolling all your dice again and repeating the steps above until either you defeat the last engine, siege engine or your fortress falls. Roll dice, get hit by siege engines, resolve an event, spend your dice and cards, the vanguard attacks, enemies advance, then reinforce. A pretty smooth flow once you get used to it. Yeah, Siege of Valeria is a pretty straightforward game that I think does a pretty solid job of recreating the tension I imagine is part of a siege. I've never actually been part of one to know for sure, but I have to assume it's pretty tense. Now, this is not an easy game, and you can expect to lose handily your first couple of plays. And even when you do win after figuring out more of the game, it's not like it feels like you're winning until that very last siege engine goes down. It really does stay tense throughout. Now, we've always wanted solo and co-op games to be hard to win, and this one is really just hard enough. Now, I didn't get many plays in, but even in defeat, you felt like you could win. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the dice just weren't on your side. Now, that said, this is a very abstract game. This is a math-heavy card and dice game that's all about puzzling out the best way to combo your dice with your cards to both take out the siege engines and to mitigate the damage being done to your turrets each turn. Now, as with most Valeria games, there are plenty of ways to modify your dice, and figuring out which modifiers to use, when and in what order, only adds to the maths and complexity. Now, what I found most interesting are the hard choices presented in this game. Like, when troops are in the vanguard, do you let that vanguard troop crash against your walls, taking them out, or do you try to and, and taking a damage, or do you try to prevent that? I also like the decision of what to take out based on what it would do for me once the card entered your hand. So everything you take out becomes a card that you can then use for future turns. So sure, I could save my dice and let that big eight strength troop with two tokens on it crash into my walls and only take one impact damage. But if I take it out, I can now double one of my dice, possibly leading to a pretty easy takedown of a siege engine. There were no easy decisions here, and the replayability of the game is quite high. The randomness of the decks means that even if you know how to defeat something, you're likely going to have a completely different set of tools mm. the next time you face it. Now, one of the keys to playing Siege of Valeria well and increasing your odds of winning is getting to know the cards that are in the deck, including both the Siege deck as well as the um, Troop deck. Don't do what I did the first play and not even read what the siege engines that are up in front of you do until they were in range to attack. I was so focused on the vanguard and the cards up front that I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, they're siege engines. I'll worry about those later. That led to a very quick loss for me as I didn't realize that a siege engine could do a certain thing where it was doing two impact to me on a tower that had already had two flame tokens on it. While playing to see what happens can be fun. You may want to actually read through the entire deck of cards, either before you play or after your first learning game, just to play a learning game, just to learn the mechanics without the strategy. Now, while system mastery is important, for me, it's something that would come from multiple plays. If you want to up your odds of victory, though, reading ahead is definitely recommended. Now, my biggest complaint about this game is just how much stuff there is to keep track of. 
It just it's fiddly. It's it's one of the more fiddly games I played. Now, some of this is because of the dice management, because you have all these piles of two different types of dice. You've got your pile of red dice that you've earned and your blue dice you've earned. And then you've got the pile that you haven't earned on the side. And then once your turn starts out of those piles you have earned, you got to keep track of which ones you spent already and which ones you haven't. And then there's cards that add dice where you get to take them from the unused dice and put them with your dice. And then there's cards that you, you I forget the term, but banish and you lose those dice. And then other dice you sometimes carry over. And there's all kinds of management of dice. What I strongly suggest when playing this is using a dice tray or tower to manage it. Um, thankfully, my particular dice tray has two sides, a top and a bottom, and that worked really well for me, at least for me, to keep track of what I've spent and what I haven't. So I didn't find the dice management too awkward, but I did find that overall the game took up a bit more space than I wanted it to. Yeah. I'm not a solo gamer, so it might be my expectations were misaligned. But I felt like it needed more table than I wanted to give up for a solo game. Now, along with the dice and, and the amount of space the game takes up, you also have all these different cards, and every card has its own unique ability. After the first few rounds, every time I played up with this game, I've ended up with a large hand of cards to manage, and what to spend and keeping track of those was a little difficult. And then with that are all the counters you can earn. So there's strength counters, and then there's magic counters, and you can have a pile you've earned, and you can spend those to get plus one, but some of them also end up out on the board and they can build up out there. And then there's each event somehow changes the rules that turn. And sometimes you have to remember the event that's currently in play because it affects the entire rounds, while other times it just does a single point thing. And while I get that the entire point of this game, what the draw is, is that this is a big puzzle and you have all these pieces to manage. It's really easy, I found, to miss something. So I think coming up with a standard way of sorting your cards may be the key here. Though that will be a very personal choice, as it's not as simple as just a few suits to manage. Now, I also found that the game did to feel feel a little repetitive after a small number of plays. Um, for the number of cards in the game, I was surprised to see how many were the same card, like just multiple copies of the same card. There's lots of duplication. And even the siege engines, there aren't that many in that deck, and they aren't all unique. There's at least two or three copies of each of them. For me, this is a game that I would sit down and play and I play it once. And if I won, I'm done. I won. Siege of Valeria. Okay, put it away. Move on to something else. But if I lost, I try again. Let's try a second time. But after that second time, I found I was done. Every time I sat down to play the game. I'm like, oh, I didn't win this time. We'll try it again some other time. And then I would put it back on my shelf only to bring it out, I don't know, a couple of weeks later. And again, I played one or two games. One if I won, two if I lost. Now, I do know there's an expansion out there that I hear makes the game more variable, more interesting and more replayable, especially in a single sitting, that adds a whole campaign element about improving your forces. And I got to say, it sounds fantastic. I do own it, and I do plan to try it next, but I haven't even touched it yet. I haven't even read the rules, because I wanted to review the base game as a standalone experience for anyone who just goes into a store and picks it up without the, without the expansion. Now, while I agree there is a repetitiveness, you can't avoid that. I think the randomness of the cards in the game can overcome that. But okay. you have to be okay with that randomness and that of the dice, which, of course, is going to turn off many a Euro lover. Yeah, this is not a perfect information, make your opening move, plan ahead. Once you see the cards out, engage your master plan. There is definitely a lot of variability. Um, while the game does reward strategy, it is very tactical. Now, take all of these complaints that, that I would say probably both of us have, especially mine with a grain of salt, because I am not a solo gamer. I've never been a solo board gamer. If it's just me and there's no one else to play with, I'm going to go online and play some games instead of break out a game like Siege of Valeria. It's very likely that someone who does enjoy solo board gaming isn't going to mind the fiddliness, the things you have to track, the amount of table space it takes up, how long it takes to set up and put away. They'll probably enjoy the system mastery required by learning all the cards and playing repetitively and, and enjoy the learning curve of how much better they get at the game as they start to master those elements. And they're probably going to eventually learn the count of each card in the deck and know to prepare for that whatever big 12 monster that you know is going to come sometime. And they're probably going to enjoy playing repetitively until they win. But that's just not how I play games. Yeah, indeed. I think it is the repetitiveness that is absolutely something the solo gamers embrace. Uh, and if you do, it's not like there aren't enough cards. In fact, there seem to be just the right amount of cards for the puzzle they have posed. 
So overall, I thought Siege of Valeria was a solid solo game experience, even as someone who doesn't normally enjoy single player games. It was challenging enough to make me want to keep trying, but it's just a little too fiddly for my taste. Now, one thing that did stick out, though, is as a dice game, it didn't feel overly random. The number of the cards, like almost all the cards in the game, pretty much every card manipulates the dice in some way or gives you that extra strength you may be missing or whatever. And it never made me feel like my game was in the hands of fate. It always felt like it was something I chose to do that was either causing me to win or lose. Agreed. Similarly, not a solo player, but I could see how it was a game that draws players in and makes them want to solve that puzzle provided with each new play. So if you enjoy solo gaming, you're probably going to want to pick up Siege of Valeria, a solid dice-driven tower defense game that rewards multiple plays and really getting to know the cards. If you like puzzles and trying to figure out the best possible card and dice combo, you're probably going to love the core mechanics of this game. Soon enough, you'll find yourself praying for certain forces to emerge so you can better take on the encroaching siege engines. Now, if you don't normally enjoy playing games on your own, I don't know if this game would win you over. I did find it more entertaining and engaging than some solo games I've tried, but I would still rather play a multiplayer game over this. And to be fair, the Valeria series on its own offers me plenty of options there. I'm in full agreement here. I think Mo and I fall in the same place for solo gaming. We're more about the social aspects of board games and solo play doesn't deliver on that. Plus, yeah. there's no one else to help you set up and tear down. That's true. Now, if you just dig Valeria games, I say we have fair disclosure here. We're kind of Valeria fanboys around here. Um, it's probably worth picking this game up to complete your collection. There's enough Valeria about this game between the Miko's artwork, the strength and magic resources, the fact you can't use magic on its own. It's got to be combined with strength, the familiar champion cards with their different factions. The monstrous hordes are all even going to look familiar. And of course, the spending of dice to do things. That just makes this feel like a Valeria game, though a Valeria game with a very different taste than the rest of them. Well, thank you for joining us for this review of The Siege of Valeria, the last of the Valeria small box games that we have reviewed. When you're done here, we welcome you to check out our reviews of Thrones of Valeria and Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, and then let us know which of these three new Valeria games you enjoyed most. Now, for me, it's time to crack open Siege of Valeria campaign expansion and see what that adds to the game and see if it turns Siege into more of a game for me. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Yeah, this is going to be probably our shortest Bellhop's Tabletop segment ever. Um, there's just a lot of stuff going on with my parents right now and other stuff going on in my life that I didn't play a single game since we were last here. You know, it's a bad week when I don't manage to get at least one game in. It just didn't happen. Unfortunately, I didn't get any gaming in. Despite having DC deck building plans, we chose to partake in some other family activities instead. So the games ended up staying off the table. And that's sadly it for what we've been playing. But let's look at what we have coming up next. So with everything going on, um, unfortunately, it's very possible this could be another dry week for me. Um, what I do have on my docket is to get caught up on stuff from last week because I haven't been at home a lot and haven't been at my computer. So there is some stuff that needs to get done that didn't get done. Uh, for example, the leading the charge review still hasn't been posted on the blog. So I do have to finish that up. And I'm looking forward to getting our no context YouTube video out there. Though I have to say so far, the written review has proving to be rather popular. And I've got to say, if you want to see a company um, handling social media well, Check out the Skybound team and their willingness to reshare other people's content. I am extremely impressed. So thank you, Skybound, for multiple members of your team for sharing, sharing our review out there. So that's pretty awesome. Now, maybe, hopefully, things will calm down a little bit and we can fit in a game on Friday night. But honestly, at this point, I can't even promise that. Well, this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark Podcast. Wondering if we'll see any of you in Ohio. Dukas. Thank you. Evil John. Thank you, John. Well, that was the double bell.
That means our shift's coming to an end and the goblin's losing his grip on the portcullis. Oh, boom, there it goes. Though the doors are closed, the portcullis is down. You can still always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Help keep our show going and keep us talking by tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live. And be sure to stick around for the Penthouse Suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.